Landon Wilkie, curator here at the historic Wendover Airfield. And I'm Thomas Peterson, a member of the Board of Directors here at the museum. So 75 years ago this month, we marked the anniversary of the end of World War II. A lot of that which is all tied up in the final operations that happened here in Wendover before the end of the war that led to the creation of the atomic bombs. So here we have our replica built by John Coster Mullen, a nuclear archaeologist of a little boy bomb. This is the one that was dropped on Hiroshima, August 6, 1945, changing the world forever. The first time one of these atomic or nuclear weapons was actually used in combat. And that all ties back to the work that went on here in Wendover. So some of the things that happened here that we're going to discuss, first of all, the 509th Composite Group. So this was the actual atomic mission group that the Army Air Force put together to figure out how to deliver these types of weapons. These two unique devices, both weighing about 10,000 pounds from a new altitude with new technology. That was going on in Wendover. So December 17, 1944, the 509th was actually created here in Wendover with a series of um, different squadrons and elements in it to make it a self-sustaining group. But of those was the 393rd Bomb Squadron actually flying the B-29s. Um, then we also had the 1st Ordnance Squadron that Tom will talk about, the 603rd Air Engineering Group um, Squadron, and other ones that we will mention throughout the video. But of course, um, the 509th was led by Colonel Paul Tibbetts. So he was here in Wendover until in spring and summer of 1945, these guys started deploying to Tinian Island. But today we're going to talk about this work done here in Wendover leading up to the use of these weapons. So Tom will talk about the 1st Ordnance Squadron and the 216th also instrumental. Thanks Landon. Looking at the bomb, it's kind of cool. We have a bunch of original signatures from members of the various components of the 509th. Today, this video that Landon and I are going to make is focusing on specifically the work that the 216th base unit special and the first ordnance squadrons did as well as uh, a number of elements from the other squadrons so our, our journey today is we're literally going to take you from the be very beginning out up, up at the railroad tracks the warehouses out to where a completely assembled test unit would have been prepped and loaded for the b-29 so with Lana, we're excited to be able to present this and hope you enjoy the video we're now at the warehouse area of historic Wendover Airfield. Originally, there were six warehouses which were serviced by a single spur from the main rail line. The components and pieces for the bomb would arrive and be unpacked and moved from this area out to South Base. Walter Gorecki with the 509th recalled one such shipment. I recall the first car of freight for the group and its arrival. I opened the car and looked inside. Everything was normal there. Lieutenant McLennan, an intelligence officer, questioned me regarding opening of the said box car, and I replied, I always open to see where the freight is to be sent. At this time, it was unusual material. He further stated that if anything arrives for the 509th or any organization attached to the 509th, do not open it until someone from the group would be present. Now that the pieces have arrived, been unpackaged and loaded, we'll take the, the trip those components would have gone from warehouse out to South Assembly area. Now we've arrived at the South Base Technical Area. So this is where the 1st Ordnance Squadron and the 216th Army Air Force Base Unit Special were actually doing the bulk of their work um, constructing these prototype atomic bombs. 
So we're going to talk more about their operations out here in this area. We were driven to an area south of the field to some fenced-in buildings. We had to get out of the car and walk through a security check gate. We were introduced to Captain Lesro and Lieutenant Westrip. They took us to one of the buildings. As soon as I entered into the building, I saw several large bombs. We were told the smaller bombs were called Little Boy and the larger bombs were called Fat Man. Joseph Badali, 216th Base Unit Special. My first job on the bomb was to install a set of baffle plates in the tail section. Because the bomb was so large, the tail assembly could not make the bomb fall true. Robert Shade, 1st Ordnance Squadron. Inside the fence, the road jogged left and then right and passed between two structures. The one on the right and directly ahead of the gate was a typical 20-foot wide wooden GI building and attached to the far end was another, but slightly wider and taller, one-story GI building. Opposite, on the left side of the road, was a 40 by 80 foot metal frame building with roof, sides, and ends of corrugated sheet steel. Attached to this metal building on the side nearest the fence line was a wooden lean-to structure. Each of the tasks that I later came to know as the W47 project had its beginning in the metal part of this structure. James Les Rowe, 216th base unit special. So there were a number of different structures that were used to assemble the components for the bombs, but one of the most important pieces that we have left remaining in this south base technical area is actually this hunk of concrete right here. So in this building they would have had a big trolley system where they could have moved around the more or less assembled prototype bombs, but what they would do is they were lowered onto this slab right here for ease of work, for installing components or filling them with concrete so they could achieve that about 10,000 pound weight for training. Occasionally, someone would call from Los Alamos saying they were getting really noisy signals. I'll never forget suggesting they mount a telemetry transmitter using Zeus fasteners so it wouldn't shake all over. A week later, they called at 10.30 p.m. and wanted me to be their technical contact at Wendover. Lawrence DeQueer. First Ordnance Squadron. From here, the bombs were brought out to the loading pit. However, in the intervening years, and as this is an active airport, the road on this side of the airport that would have originally been taken has been changed and moved. So, we'll take an approximate route. Hold on to your hats, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> Now we've arrived at one of our atomic bomb loading pits. So this one is one we know for sure was used to load these gadgets as they were called. So they would have been constructed at the south base where we just came from. They would have been carted over on a trailer. At all times they're covered in a tarp so you can't see what's being transported and worked on out here on the south base. But these would be lowered in with an army wrecker here out here at Wendover into this pit. There would have been a hydraulic lift station at the bottom and that was going to give it the power it needed to get inside of a B-29. So one of those B-29s would have come down this taxiway and then it would be pushed back over by a tug to be lined up over top of this bomb and using that hydraulic lift it would be lifted into the belly of the aircraft so it could fulfill its mission. We had to dig and construct a pit so First Ordnance could make a cradle to hold the bomb in a stable position as it was raised into the aircraft standing over the pit. Robert Shade, First Ordnance Squadron. From the bomb pit, the loaded B-29 would be taken back down the taxiway to the ramp where an awaiting crew could pick up their airplane and fly the practice mission. We'll follow that, and then we'll be done with today's quick tour of this unique piece of history. 
Remember to subscribe for more videos in the future and like this video. You can help the museum simply by doing those two things. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thanks.